All right, just to bring you up to speed a little bit, 1 Kings chapter 12, of course, uh, the last chapter that we went through, 1 Kings 11, just ended up with um, Solomon's death. And, of course, they, um, it was prophesied that because of Solomon's sins, because of him building altars unto these false gods and hearkening unto his, his wives that turned his heart away from God, the result of that, the result of his sins, is that God was going to take the kingdom away from him. And he was going to leave only one tribe left to the house and lineage of David for David's sake, because David followed the Lord with all his heart. But because of Solomon's sins, he broke it up, split it into two. And in the last chapter, it was prophesied unto Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was an industrious man, the Bible says. He was, he was a hard worker. He was a mighty man. Uh, he, he held a lot of respect. Even King Solomon respected him and, and put him into higher positions of power until the point where it was prophesied that Jeroboam is going to be ruling over the rest of Israel when it gets divided up after Solomon. And, and because of that, Solomon wanted to kill Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, because he wanted his son to take over the whole kingdom, even though it was going against God's will. And, he, and you know, God was going to bring this punishment regardless. And instead of Solomon getting right with God, he decided to try to kill Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. So we're picking up here in chapter number 12 with Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, becoming king. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. So he's being now um, ordained as the king over, over all the nation of Israel. And verse two says, And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon. And Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt, that they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore, make thou the grievous service of thy father, and his heavy yoke, which he put upon us, lighter, and we will serve thee. And he said unto them, Depart yet for three days, then come again to me, and the people departed. So, Jeroboam comes back out of hiding. He comes out of Egypt because now he realizes, okay, Solomon wanted him killed. Solomon's dead. He remembers the prophecy and even the people in Israel were like, okay, Jeroboam, come back now. You know, come back into the land. Solomon's gone. Let's go and talk to Rehoboam and see what he's going to do. And basically, they approach the king, brand new king. They're saying, king, you know, your father had us working really hard. And we went through all of the works that Solomon did, and he did many more works and built more things even than what's uh, completely recorded in the Bible. It said he built a lot of things. It doesn't tell us all the specifics on them. But the Bible tells us uh, that you know, he did all these many wonderful works, and Ecclesiastes kind of goes through some of that as well. But um, he built the temple. He built his own house. He built another house in the forest. He built, you know, he built all these great works all in that area. And... The people were working pretty hard. Now, for a while, everyone was really happy and everyone was glad and everyone was happy to do the work of the Lord and, and the fame of the, of the glory of the Lord was spread abroad throughout all the earth. But as we saw in previous chapters, when Solomon got too lifted up and too proud and, and brought in all this wealth and all this money in abundance and, and multiplied to himself horses. He started getting into sin. His heart turned away from God and, and the wives ultimately led his heart astray into serving these false gods. And as a result of that sin, that sin has a huge impact on everybody. It wasn't just Solomon's own sin that was just affecting him. His sin had an impact on a huge number of people. And I believe a lot of people then be, became disgruntled with Solomon. One, when you have a great leader to follow, and I went into this a little bit last week, when they're consistent, when they're not a hypocrite, when you can see someone honestly believe something, especially when it comes to religion, when it comes to serving the Lord, and, and they practice what they preach. They don't just say and they don't do, right? There's someone who you can hear what they're saying. They're taking a strong stand. They're being real bold, but then they go out and do the same exact thing. Hey, there's someone you can follow. There's someone who believes what they say. But then you get someone who's trying to, to preach and, and say all these things, but then they don't go and do these things or they do the exact opposite. No one's going to have confidence in that person. And it really is just ultimately when they start off real good, they end up being a big letdown. 
And again, I'm not going to re-preach last week's sermon. You know, that's the reason why we don't want to just put too much confidence in any one man. But as a man who's, who's a leader and, you know, anybody who, who's leading people and directing people, we need to be even more, all the more careful to make sure our testimony remains pure and good so that we're not doing so much more damage to everyone else who might be looking to you and following you and looking to you as an example. And Solomon did tre a tremendous amount of damage by not being able to keep a good, pure testimony all the way up to the end. I mean, he, he had a great testimony for a long time until he finally uh, um, failed, and, and failed in a, in a big way. So here we are now. They come to, so to Rehoboam, Solomon's son, and they're saying, you know what, can you just make our, our burdens a little bit lighter? I mean, Solomon really taxed us pretty hard for, for working and doing this labor and getting everything set up, and, and we, just, we need a little bit of a break. We need a little bit of a rest. So Rehoboam says, okay, you know, come back to me in three days. I'm going to think about this, and I'll give you my answer in three days. So let's see what he does. He goes to his counselors. Look at verse number six. And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived and said, How do ye advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day and wilt serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the old men, which they had given him, and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him, and which stood before him. And he said unto them, What counsel give ye, that we may answer this people, who have spoken to me, saying, Make the yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter. And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people, that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. And now, whereas my father did lay you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father hath chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So Solomon gets some good advice from the old men from the people that had experience, from the people that had wisdom, from the people that were counselors for his father, King Solomon, who had more wisdom than any other man, who I'm sure was teaching his counselors many things and in the right way out of, out of the scripture. He forsakes the good wisdom and he decides to go with the, the counsel of the young men that grew up with him. Now, I'm going to get into that a little bit. I'm going to, I don't want to get ahead of myself, though, because there's so many points to make just about what he did here. He ends up forsaking, basically, the wisdom of the old path. And we need to be careful that we are going back to the old paths and the old ways continually to get our wisdom, our knowledge, what is right. Too many people rely on modern times. What's, what does our culture dictate is right and what's wrong? Well, that's always changing. It always has changed throughout the times. If you're just going to go to a given region, a given period of time, what's right and wrong changes all throughout time. But you know what doesn't change? God's Word. God's Word has the old ways. It has the old standard. This is always right. This is always wrong. There are cultures that say stealing is fine. There are cultures that say, oh, who would ever think stealing is fine? There's people that believe that. There's been different times in history where that has been acceptable. That's just morally fine. No problem. Or maybe it depends on who you steal from, right? There's all these various things that, that come into play in, in various cultures. You know, polygamy is fine in many cultures. There's, you know, all, all various things that you might think is completely wrong. Other people don't have a problem with it. There's been cultures like the Romans and others that even think that pedophilia is okay. Older men and younger boys, that that's just fine. That is disgusting and ought to turn your stomach, but that's how sick and twisted and turn around societies have gotten, and that's how sick and twisted this society is becoming that we're living in today. It's not far off, mark my words. They're already trying to normalize this stuff. It's nothing new. It's already been. Other civilizations have all gone through the same, the same cycle of, of accumula conquering, accumulating a lot of wealth, being blessed, 
and then falling into decadence, falling into sin, and getting into the most bizarre, twisted, perverted things and saying that those are just fine. It's happened before, it's happened, it'll happen again. We cannot allow wherever you're living and whatever society says at the moment to tell you what's right and what's wrong. Solomon listened to the advice of his young friends, the ones that grew up with them, the society that they grew up in, which, by the way, they grew up in a society where they had everything handed to them. Don't forget, Solomon's reign, the time that Rehoboam grew up in, was a time of peace. They didn't have to fight and earn anything that they received. They had it all handed to them. They don't have the same level of respect. See, David, when he became king, he commanded the respect of the people. Why? Because he went out and fought the battles. He got his hands dirty. He lived a life of integrity. He did what was right by God and by man for the vast majority of his life. That's who he was known for. People respected that. People will serve that type of leader. People will follow that type of leader. Solomon, his son, where was his heart at in the beginning? He wanted to know how to rule and reign his people, so he went to God. God, give me the wisdom. And what did he do, especially at the beginning? He did right by man. He did right by God. Everybody loved it. The people that were serving at the temple, everybody loved it. Everyone was happy in their service of Solomon, and things were going great. But now you got Rehoboam. Rehoboam, who didn't really have to fight for anything. Rehoboam, that didn't have the challenges that even Solomon faced. Everything's handed to him. And his buddies, they all grew up with all this wealth, all this prosperity. Everything's handed to him. So what do they say? Oh, who are these people? And you could, see, you could just feel the complex, the superiority, comp superiority complex that these people have when the peasants come, the minions come and say, oh, you, you know, it's a little bit too hard on us. These people who don't know what it's like to work that hard and to labor because they've had everything. They didn't have to do the labor. They could just relax and enjoy all the wealth. They look down on these people and say, well, who do you think you are? Oh, you're going to come to me? And they get lifted up in themselves and in their pride and in their arrogance and just say, well, I'm going to make it even harder on you. How do you like that? That's, his, that's the advice that Rehoboam gets from his young friends. And it's stupid advice. That's not the way a leader leads. That's not, if you want to lead a people and do a good job, that is, is so far from the opposite. He forsakes the old way. He forsakes the old path. The Bible says in Jeremiah 6, 16, you have to turn there. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where is the good way and walk therein. See, Rehoboam, he asked for the old path. He went to the old men. He got their advice. But you know what he didn't do? He didn't walk therein. It's important that not only do you get the advice, but you actually receive it and take it. It says, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Just like Rehoboam, we will not walk therein. Proverbs 24, 6 says, For by wise counsel... Thou shalt make thy war, and in multitude of counselors there is safety. Rehoboam seemed to have gotten part of this from his father, from Solomon, that wrote the, that penned down these proverbs. He had a multitude of counselors. The problem is he made a really foolish decision and didn't choose the wise counselors. He surrounded himself not only with the wise, but with the foolish. So Rehoboam makes this, this bad mistake and he, and he follows this advice of his young men that grew up with him. Look at verse number 12. Bob reads, So Jer Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had appointed, saying, Come to me again the third day. So the people all show up. Now they want to hear the king's answer. Kings had time to, to talk to his counselors and to make his decision. Verse 13 says, And the king answered the people roughly. And forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him, and spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. That's a pretty harsh thing to say to these people. Look, these people have been laboring and working for Solomon for decades, for years. They've been working and working and working, and they're saying, Look, can you just lighten up a little bit? And he, and he goes... He takes it to a whole nother level. Say, so you, you, know, you were chastised with whips? I mean, think about that. I don't know if that's true or not, but it, but it sounds like it probably was. 
that they had a taskmaster over them. They were getting to the point of, of being in bondage pretty much almost like they were in Egypt. Now, and they're saying, can you lighten up on us a little bit? And he says, yeah, you think the whips were bad? Now I'm going to start using scorpions. Obviously, it's figurative language, but, but that's, he's getting his point across very clearly. This is an extremely foolish way to rule. It doesn't matter if you're ruling a kingdom or ruling your house. This is not the way that you want to rule. The wise counsel was to be a servant to the people once. He says, you know what? If you listen to these people, if you serve them now, if you, if you, if you entreat for them now, he says, they'll serve you forever. They'll be your servants for the rest of your time here. You just, just listen to them, back off a little bit, hear what they have to say, and they'll love you for it. That's wise. There's many reasons why that's great wisdom, right? I mean, you're, you're making a connection with the people. You're, you're being heard of them, and you actually care about them. You're showing that you care about their, their concerns and their needs as a ruler. But what does he choose? He chooses to be a dictator. He chooses to say, I don't care about you. You're just going to do what I want you to do, and that's the end of it. That is his decision in ruling, and it's a very poor way to lead. Keeping people in constant fear is always a very poor way to lead. It works for a while. It does. We've seen it happen in communism and in you know, fascism and socialism. You see these various ways, and you, and you hear the stories of people who have come out of these governments where they're scared to death all the time that someone's going to turn them into the government, that the government's going to come away and take everything that they have, put them in these, you know, off, to, off to prison, off to Siberia or whatever, and they're living in constant fear. They're worried people are going to be ratting them out. Why? Because the rulers ruled with an iron fist and just had no compassion, didn't care at all, and were just, just ready to, to send people off and treat them as cattle and not as human beings. And that is a horrible way to, leave, to lead. Now, you say, okay, I'm probably never going to be the ruler of any nation, right? So how does this apply to me? Well, there's many ways to lead, and the leading that you do doesn't have to be over a kingdom. We still want to make sure fathers that you're not just a dictator in the home. Now, you have the authority to be a dictator in the home, according to God. The Bible gives the husbands the authority over their home to rule and to reign over their home and to decide what everybody's going to do, right? At least within the realm of the power that God's given them. So nothing that, that breaks God's commandments because they don't, you don't have that authority. But you, you do have that, that power, but... The way that you choose to lead, you don't want to just always be leading in fear all the time so that your whole family is just scared of you every, every waking moment. That just, we don't want to do anything to set dad off. That is not a good way to run your household. That is not wise. We need to have compassion. We need to be able to listen to your, to your, to your spouse and your children and the people that are following you. And your children will follow your example more than what you say. And you got to remember, people who have children, take this to heart. We all have good intentions in raising our children. And, and we all make up rules uh, and, and the things we want them to follow, things we want them to obey. They'll hear those things. They'll get some learning from that. But you know what they're going to learn the most from? They're going to learn the most from what you do. They watch what you do. They watch every little thing, good and bad. For the good stuff, great. Praise God, they're getting that. But it's the bad stuff we got to watch out for. Because they're paying attention to everything that you do. And if you want to be a good leader in the home, you need to lead by example. You need to truly follow the, the, the wisdom of Scripture that says, you know, to treat people the way you have to be treated in, in all these various situations. Now, you may be a leader, but how would you like to be led if someone was in charge of you? How would you like to be treated if you were in a position where you had somebody over you? And you need to think about those things and remember. Now, um, obviously God's given you authority, but what are you going to do with that authority? How are you going to lead? If you want your children to, be, to grow up and be hard workers, well, are you a hard worker? Or do they just see you sitting on the couch, eating potato chips, turning on the TV, while you're telling them to go and do all your work for you? I'll tell you what, they may do it. They may do it because they're your children. They may do it because, because they're scared, because they're fear. Like, hey, I don't want to get disciplined, right? And I'm not saying that's wrong, but 
you're not going to give them the proper knowledge and the skills that they're going to need by, not doing, by telling them one thing and doing another because that's going to stick with them. And there's going to be a point when they grow up and they get on their own. And then what are they going to do? It's a lot more likely that they're going to follow your example than to actually continue and do the work once they're out of the house and gain the real valuable lessons. Now, this goes for mothers as well because mothers are also leaders in the home. They don't have all the authority that the father has, but you're still teaching and, and, and guiding your children. And, they, and you are an authority figure to them. And you are ruling your household, especially while the husband's gone and you know, off working and providing for the family. You need to lead your children. And there's many ways to do it. Again, it's the same thing. Do you want your children to be hard workers? Well, then you need to be a hard worker. Think about this too. Do you believe in Scripture and God's Word and, and what the Bible says? Because this is, this is a common problem with the different gender roles. You have daughters at home. You want them to grow up to be godly young women. Well, then you need to be the example of a godly woman yourself. You need to be um, exhibiting the respect for your husband and, and his authority just like you would want them to do when they grow up and get married. You respect your husband and show them how it's done. There's so many ways that we need to lead. And ultimately what it boils down to is having compassion on, on those that you're in charge over and leading by example. Being someone who's willing to do all of the work that you expect of anyone else to do. Getting right down there with them and doing it. See, if, if um, had Rehoboam grown up doing some of the labor that these people were doing, he'd have a very different perspective on what, on what he's, the, the consequences of what he's actually telling these people to do than if, had he not done it. Like, he, like it is, you know, it's, it's funny, uh, just kind of a side note, sometimes you work at jobs where um, maybe you work, you've worked at low-level jobs and you've had some managers come in, right? And they hire people from outside. They don't know anything about any of the work that they're doing. And then they just come in and they're like, you need to do this and you need to do this. And you're thinking to yourself like, this is stupid. This is a big waste. This is all dumb because they haven't had the time to, like, to go through those things, right? It's a lot harder to lead and to manage depending on what the role is to, um, to get things done efficiently when they haven't done the things themselves. And here we have Rehoboam just saying, nope, you just need to work harder and, and really stick into these people instead of, um, instead of leading righteously and seeking the wisdom from God. You know, he went to his counselors, but he never, the Bible never says that he went to see what God, what God had to say about the matter. And he didn't go to the, he didn't receive the godly wisdom that he was receiving. So he gets himself in a lot of trouble here. And we see this is, this ends up being the, the tipping point for the people. Uh, let's see the reaction here. Verse number 16. The Bible says, So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. So they rejected them. They say, Fine. We have no inheritance in David. They say, and, and think about this, too. You can understand the cause of their dissatisfaction. A lot of the effort has been put forth to build everything that Solomon wanted to build. And everything that Solomon wanted to build was pretty much located in Judah, right? All these great buildings and all the fancy structures and everything was being done all there. Well, there was 12 tribes, right? And, and that, that nation of Israel was a pretty big nation. So you got people coming in to do all this work over here. Now they're finally saying, hey, can you let up on us a little bit? And he says, No. And they're like, well, what inheritance do we have over here anyways? See ya. You're not getting work from us anymore, right? To your tent, so Israel, we're, we're out of here. You see to your own house. And, that, and they just rejected him. They rebelled against him. And, um, you know, you can see why, why should they be dedicating so much time and effort just to have one tribe have all the fruits of their labor? So let's keep reading in verse 17. But as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. So Rehoboam still retains his kingdom, but it's only over Judah. Now verse 18 reads, Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the tribute, and all Israel stoned him with stones that he died. Therefore King Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So 
we see here he's trying to flex his muscles a little bit, right? He's saying, no, I am the king. Like, you can't, you're not going to say that to me. I'm still going to rule over you. And he goes and sends his tax collector out there into the land of Israel saying, "Go, no, they need to pay tribute, right? They kill the tax command. They're saying, yeah, right. And it scares Rehoboam to get back to the palace and say, okay, I need to get out of here for my own safety now because they're serious about this. This is actually a good lesson in power and how power works. You see, there's actual power and there's perceived power. And a lot of times people can get away with the perceived power. But the true power is given. It's something that people, you have to actually give up. And the more people realize this, the more you realize how much power you can possess, especially in a group of people when you band together, how much power can actually be there that figureheads are just people. And once the figureheads lose, you know, the, the support, the consent of the governed, they don't have that power anymore. And for a while, they can play off on the perception of, of that power that they once had. But after a while, it's gone. And um, see, he, he tried to retain his perceived power by sending the tax man, but the people refused to give him that power, and they killed the tax man and showed him that he is not going to rule over them. And verse 19 says, So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. And we need to remember too, just as people, we have, we have a lot more power in general than a lot of people realize and think. And... Um, these politicians in Washington and, and wherever, you know, that, that are supposed to be representative of the people, but are just total wicked reprobates for the most part and just concerned about themselves and their own money and stuff. If, if more people would just say, I reject, and say, you know, no, I'm, I'm not, you don't, you don't have control over me, you don't have power over me. You know, after a while, um, they wouldn't have that power if you don't, if you don't give it to them. Now, there still is a power in, in military and force, which is power. There is, there is actual power in that. But enough people in their minds decide, we're not going to take this anymore. Power changes. Yeah. And that's the key to beating oppression is, one, getting right with God, first and foremost. We have to get right with God. But the more people that you can convince to get right with God and get on God's plan... You're taking the power away from, you know, these, these tyrants that want to rule over you and giving the power back to God. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 20. And it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and called him unto the congregation and made him king over all Israel. There was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. So Israel pretty much, they come together and they, they rally around this one guy around Jeroboam. He led the fight, you know, he was, he was a fighting for the people, right? He led that fight against Rehoboam, and the people respected that. He was a mighty man of valor. He was, he was an industrious man. He had done a lot of work in the past. He had a reputation about him. And the most important thing was he had it prophesied that he was going to be ruler. So now they say, forget you, Rehoboam. Forget the house of Judah. We are going to um, have our own king over us. And this is when the kingdom is officially split so let's keep reading here. Verse number 21. And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin and hundred and four score thousand chosen men, which were warriors, to fight against the house of Israel to bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. So Rehoboam wasn't completely without actual power. And this is where his actual power was. As he had 180,000 troops, he's going to say, okay, we're going to go reclaim this kingdom by war by fighting it out and defeating them in battle. That was his plan. Verse 22, But the word of God came unto Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and unto all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not go up nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing is from me. They hearkened therefore to the word of the Lord and return to depart according to the word of the Lord. 
So they finally got some sense into him. Instead of making a bad situation even worse, they listened to the man of God. They listened to the word of the Lord. As God said, don't, don't you go after them. I'm the one who caused this to happen. And by fighting against them, you're going to be fighting against me is essentially what he said. I'm adding to that, but that's basically what he was saying to them. He's saying, don't go and fight them. This is what I wanted to happen. Verse number 25. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein and went out from thence and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So remember what I was just saying, how the power, when the people, you know, for us, when, when you convince more people to get right with God, then the power is going to go back to God. Jeroboam had a little bit twisted understanding of this, thinking that when the people go back to Jerusalem, because that was where the temple was. That is where everybody goes to worship and to serve the Lord. And he understands how powerful faith is, how powerful having that, that faith in the Lord and, and serving God supersedes anything that you would be, uh, you know, giving adherence to a man, right, to a king. People will do things for God more than they'll do things for a man. So he's worried that these people, you know, yeah, I'm king over them now. They, they, they wanted me to be king. But when they go back to Jerusalem, their heart's going to go back to the house of David and they're going to kill me and just rejoin back and, and bring the kingdom back together. That was his fear. Now, this fear that enters into Jeroboam's heart, it was unwarranted. He should not have had this fear. This fear of man, this fear of losing his power instead of having just a proper fear of God. This fear causes him to make some very, very poor decisions and, and gets into himself into some of the worst sins that he could do. Jeroboam, think about this. Now, Jeroboam saw everything come to pass that was prophesied to him. Just in the previous chapter, he received that prophecy before he went into Egypt and he was even made the king. He literally saw what was told him come to pass around him. Back in chapter 11, look at verse 37 in chapter 11. The Bible reads, And I will take thee, and thou shalt reign according to all that thy soul desireth, and shalt be king over Israel. This is the word of God coming to Jeroboam. And it shall be, if thou wilt hearken unto all that I command thee, and wilt walk in my ways, and do that is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as David my servant did, that I will be with thee, and build thee a sure house, as I built for David, and will give Israel unto thee. This is in, in no uncertain terms a promise from God. And he fulfilled that promise. He gave him the kingdom. How, you know, what more evidence and proof does he need than everything that's already happened to him? And all he had to do was just stick right with God. And what did he end up doing? The exact opposite. He's saying, I'm going to, because he was worried about them going back to the house of David. When God said, I'll make you like the house of David. I'm going to give you all the glory. I'm going to give you all this people and all this land. And, and you will be over this great nation of Israel. Just keep my commandments and do what I say. Even after all that proof, he lacked faith. He relied on man's wisdom and had a lack of faith in God's word. Because man's wisdom is going to tell you exactly what, what he was thinking. Like, well, if I don't do something about this, these people are going to go back to them and I'm going to lose it. No faith in God's word, just thinking in terms, just, just fleshly, carnal mind. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. See, Jeroboam did not have his faith in the power of God. He was thinking, I'm going to die. There's no way I could do this because the people are just going to turn right back when they get to that temple and 
and they're going to just destroy me. No, Jeroboam, you should have had more faith in God. Instead, we see what he does. Let's keep reading here. He ends up building these idols and just completely disobeys the word of the Lord. Verse number 25, then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim. Let's see, we read that already. Verse number 27, if this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah, whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So he's literally saying now that these, these idols, these golden calves, these, these images of animals graven in gold are your gods that brought you out of Egypt. Remember, that's the same thing that Aaron said when Moses was gone up into the mountain. The same exact thing. These are your gods to replace the Lord Jehovah, God Almighty, with a statue of some golden animal is abomination in the eyes of the Lord. It is breaking the first and second commandments that he gave to build these idols. And this is how far he's willing to go to try to secure his own power. To trample underfoot the Lord. And have no respect unto God's word. But it gets worse. I mean, he, he makes these idols. Look at verse 29. And he set the one in Bethel, and the other put he in Dan. He really wants to make it convenient for these people. So that he made two idols. Saying, okay, you can either go here or go here. Don't go to Jerusalem. Verse 30. And this thing became a sin. For the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. The people actually followed him. They, they followed their leader. They went after what he said to do. Verse 31, and he made an house of high places and made priests, look at this, of the lowest of the people which were not of the sons of Levi. So he decides to make up his own priests for these own false gods and he doesn't even use, you know, a sanctified or holy people. He says it's just of the lowest of the people. So he gets the basest of men to be these religious leaders in the land. It just gets worse. I mean, it, it keeps on going worse and worse and worse. Turn if you would, keep your finger here, turn if you would to 2 Chronicles chapter 11. We're going to see the parallel passage for this. I'll read just the rest of the chapter for you from 1 Kings. While you're turning to 2 Chronicles 11. In 1 Kings, 32, 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 32, the Bible reads, And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month, on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar, so did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel priests of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel, the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the, in, the, in the month which he had devised of his own heart, and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel. And he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. So, Basically, what he's doing is he's copying the feasts that they would normally go down to Jerusalem for so that they don't go there. And who doesn't like a feast, right? He's saying there's one more thing that these people still might be drawn to worship the Lord. I need to keep them here. So we're going to hold our own feast and we're going to be sacrificing animals and we're going to have all the celebration going on here so that they have no reason to leave here and to go to Jerusalem. 2 Chronicles 11, look at verse number 13. The Bible says, And the priests and the Levites that were in all Israel resorted to him out of all their coasts. Look at this. Because not only did he make the lowest people of the land the priests for his false gods that he set up. Verse 14 of 2 Chronicles 11 says, For the Levites left their suburbs and their possession and came to Judah and Jerusalem. Remember, when the, when the, when the land was divided unto Israel... When the whole land was divided, the Levites didn't have their own land. They were doing the service and the work of the Lord, but they didn't have to stay doing the work of the Lord year round. They would take ships. So they had various cities that were set up all throughout Israel. 
that were given to them where they can live and they can abide. So they didn't all stay in Jerusalem. They were scattered throughout the nation at these various cities that were given to them as a place for them to stay in these cities because they didn't have their own inheritance. So what happens is the Levites now, they all leave all the rest of Israel and head down to Judah. It says the Levites left their suburbs and their possession and came to Judah and Jerusalem for Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office unto the Lord. So any of the work that they were doing up in those other cities and worshiping the Lord and, and you know, doing everything on the Lord, he says, nope, you guys can't do this anymore. You need to get out of here. Verse 15 says, And he ordained him priests for the high places and for the devils and for the calves which he had made. And after them, out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice unto the Lord God of their fathers. So in all of this, we see how great of an impact this has, this event has on the two nations for the rest of their existence until the carrying away captive into Babylon, on Israel and on Judah. And really, you can trace back these problems to Solomon and what he did. Had he not built up his altars for his wives and turned his heart away from the Lord, none of this would have to happen. But that's what he did. And then Jeroboam, had he only just had faith in God's word, he could have had the kingdom established in righteousness. Instead, he establishes it in unrighteousness. He sets up the devils. He sets up the lowest people of the land. And when it says lowest, it doesn't just mean like they're poor. It means that they're base. Okay, base means low. Base means they're, they're just, they are, they are not holy people. They are not righteous people. It is the lowest of the people that he sets up to be their religious leaders and to serve these false gods. And then he kicks out the Levites out of the land. So basically, he's just getting God out of Israel. He's kicking God out of Israel. And then anybody who actually still wanted to serve the Lord, right, that still said, we're not going to serve these idols and these calves. We're going to serve the Lord. You know what? They moved down to Judah too. They would go down there too. So now what he, what he ended up doing was splitting up all of the righteousness into Judah and kicking it all out of Israel. And you know what? You see that for the rest of the course of the history. It makes, it makes a lot of sense now when you keep on seeing, you know, as you go through the kings and you go through the chronicles and you see, why are the kings of Israel just almost always doing wicked? Yeah. Almost always. I mean, there are a few here and there. There's a couple that rise up that, you know what, this king of Israel, they did right in the eyes of the Lord. And, and they try to get back to serving God. But by and large, that nation of Israel has wicked kings because they have wicked people and they got taken captive way earlier even than Judah did. And it all comes back. And that's why the sin of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, is referred to all throughout those books. They're comparing kings. When, when a king does wickedly, they'll say, he did wickedly, but not as bad as Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, did. He's like the standard for being extremely wicked, just as much as David is the standard for being very righteous. Not a good standard to set. So all the godly people, they move out of Judah. The Levites go with them. They don't want to live under a ruler that would be hostile towards their faith. And why would they? But notice how important their faith was. They picked up and moved forward. They didn't say, oh, well, we can't, we can't really openly serve the Lord here, so we'll just go to these idols, but God will know in our hearts that, that, we're, that we're actually still serving him. They didn't do that. They left. They said, fine, we're out of here. We're going to pick up and go because our service to the Lord is more important than, than you or our land or anything like that. And they went and did what's right. And that's why you see on the flip side, the majority of the rulers and the kings in Judah are righteous. Not all of them, but way more than in Israel, for sure. There's a lot more of them that are following the right way. Why? Because they have the Levites there. They have the priests there. They have the people who want to serve God there. They ha still have the light. And Judah, if you remember, and this is, we're just going to close with this, 
Judah is literally where the name like the Jews comes from. You don't really hear about the Jews in the Old Testament because it's not something that happens until later on. You hear about, a lot about the Jews in the New Testament, and that's where Jesus said salvation is of the Jews, if you remember that, because they still had the light because they were the ones that was following the Lord even after their, you know, after their captivity, they went, returned back into their land. It was the people of Judah that had retained their integrity and I believe it all stems back to this point because they, they, they remained, they kept that, that light going and they had such a um, density of, of people that believe the Lord all coming into this place after Jeroboam cast them out. And you can see as you read through the book, just, just keep this, this event in mind and you're reading about Israel and all the things that they do and all the sins that they do. Why? Because of the darkness that came over the land when they cast out the Lord, when they set up their false gods. And that's the way it is in the world today. Look at the places of the world that, that worship idols. Look at India. I meant to, I meant to bring this up in my, in my sermon when I preached about Hinduism. I haven't been there personally, but I've known a lot. Of, I know some people that have been there. You don't drink the water in India. They don't eat. The, you know, I mean, there's so much filth there. And, 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 and the, the living standard is so low. And, and it's not a surprise. It's a dark place. They, they, they worship false gods. They, they, they do idolatry. You go into to many of the other places that have all of this idolatry. It's filled with, with de death and filth and, and wickedness. Because it's dark. It's darkness. They don't have the light. <clears throat> Let's try to learn from these bad examples. As Brother Robert was praying before the service, we see uh, Rehoboam, he made a bad decision, but he ended up deciding, you know what, we're not going to go into battle and we're going to listen to God this time. That was a wise decision because you know what would have happened? God would have wiped them out. Amen. Guaranteed. Jeroboam, on the other hand, lacked the faith. Let's learn to be good leaders. Learn from these bad examples. Be a good leader in, in, in whatever capacity you are a leader. Learn, learn to think about the needs and concerns of, of the people that you have rule over. And um, let's, uh, let's make sure that we've got faith in God's word and, and never doubt that faith. Because getting that fear and that doubt is only going to bring problems into your life. Spar have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the, the words that you've provided for us and these stories that you've preserved for us, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to, um, to apply the, the meaning and the, and the purpose of these stories to our own life, dear Lord. Help us to become better leaders. Help us to have more faith in your word and to, to just trust when you say something that we know that, that we can trust it fully, 100%, God. We don't have to question, we don't have to doubt it, but that we could live our lives according to that faith and not, not waver, but just be grounded and founded in your word, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.